¿Qué tal? Buena tarde. Déu n'hi do la gent que hi ha. Gràcies per haver vingut. Crec que és el segon acte que fa el CCCB així obert al públic. Se'n sent bé, sí? Doncs res, abans de començar, donar les gràcies al CCCB per haver-nos ofert aquesta oportunitat d'estar aquí presencialment, de presentar aquest acte, aquest diàleg amb el Pancaix Misra, sobretot l'oportunitat de redescobrir-lo, de llegir-lo amb aquest nou llibre, que us el recomano si no el teniu present. Gràcies a Galàxia Gutenberg també per haver-ne fet la traducció, Fanáticos Insulsos, Liberales, Raza e Imperio. Serà una conversa la que tindrem a continuació que s'emmarca dins del cicle La cicatriu colonial, que acompanya l'exposició de William Kentridge, El que no està dibuixat, i que es pot veure fins al 21 de febrer del 2021, que és el CCCB. Aquest diàleg amb el Pancaix Misra, Hai Pancaix, que aquell tenen, ens escolta des de Marrakeix. Jo crec que desvellarà moltes de les inquietuds que, com a ciutadans, jo com a periodista, com a analistes, hem tingut aquests últims quatre anys, una mica la sorpresa que ens ha generat el món anglosaxó. Com de cop i volta aquest món, sobretot als Estats Units, però també el Brexit, que el tenim, un món que el tenim classificat, jo crec que en els nostres imaginaris, com un món avançat, més avançat que el nostre, més civilitzat, el més democràtic, el més ric, el més equilibrat, modern, avantguardista. Tot això amb àmplies cometes, evidentment. Ens hem preguntat què ha passat amb aquests quatre anys, com pot ser que hagin votat el Brexit primer i després que hagin votat a Donald Trump. Jo crec que amb moltes persones ens hem fet aquestes preguntes i amb una mica de vergonya de com no ho vam veure venir, què ha passat, què està canviant, també canviarem nosaltres darrere d'ells. Perquè també som ciutadans, o ens en considerem, jo crec, d'aquest món occidental, hereus d'una tradició política que també s'empelta amb aquesta tradició anglosaxona. I amb aquests quatre anys també ens hem sentit potser una mica apartats, menys tinguts, sobretot amb el Brexit, com a ciutadans de la Unió Europea, una mica despetxados, no? Aquestes són algunes de les preguntes que el Pancaix respon en aquest llibre que us he citat, Fanáticos insulsos. Dona respostes, jo crec, desacomplexades a tot plegat i en què responsabilitza també de manera crua i a mi m'ha arribat especialment els poders fàctics com la premsa mainstream i els corrents de pensament neoliberal que a través d'un món acadèmic també molt mainstream a vegades. Jo callaré de seguida, només us voldria llegir un fragment del pròleg que farà de manera d'introducció. Ell diu, a la pàgina 21 d'aquest llibre, diu, des de la Guerra Freda fins a la guerra contra el terrorisme, els enemics de la democràcia eren amenaçants pobles estrangers i les seves cultures inferiors, ho diu en referència a països com asiàtics, africans, o les despòtiques tradicions russes o xineses, o l'islam del món àrab. Però aquesta anàlisi, continua el Pancaix, que centenars de llibres i columnes d'opinió van amplificar, no havia preparat les audiències per a veure uns matons rossos enfilats en el lloc més alt de les grans democràcies mundials. Així que va resultar que els bàrbars no estaven a punt d'arribar sinó que portaven força temps governant-nos. Pancaix, Misra, l'hem perdut, el recuperarem. És un escriptor que és nascut al nord de l'Índia, a la ciutat de Jansi. És un escriptor prolífic, ha escrit assaig, ficció, llibres de viatges, anàlisi política, també crítica literària. Però és sobretot un pensador, jo crec, valent, independent, que formula i argumenta pensaments estimulants i tenim moltes ganes de sentir-lo avui. Ja per acabar, si els mateixos mitjans que ell critica en aquest llibre, perquè ja us he dit que fa una crítica aguda a alguns mitjans mainstream, com el The Economist del Financial Times, el lloen, doncs imaginin-se si deu ser bo. El The Economist, en l'edició anglesa, diu l'hereu d'Eduard Said, en referència a l'escriptor palestí. Gràcies. 
i el Financial Times en diu el tipus de visió que el món necessita ara. Així és que sense dir res més, només presentar el Joan Vergés, la Carme Colomina i l'Agus Morales, que els hi faran preguntes i després vostès tindran un petit moment també per afegir algunes qüestions. Carme Colomina, investigadora principal del CIDOP, experta en desinformació i política global. L'Agus Morales, director periodista, director de la revista 5W i corresponsal de l'Agència EFE durant 6 anys a l'Índia i al Pakistan. I el filòsof Joan Vergés, director de la càtedra Ferratemora i expert en la història del liberalisme polític. Jo soc Isabel Galí, periodista TV3 i estic aquí per fer de mediadora. Així que sense més, Pankaj, the floor is yours. Pankaj? Can you hear us? Sí? Sabeu si ens sent? Només el traductor? The floor is yours, Pankaj. Fins ara ha funcionat bé, les proves han funcionat perfectament. Sembla com el Big Brother, no? El tenim aquí com... Però segur que el tindrem aquí de seguida. Ha funcionat bé, ha fet una mica al principi, després ha funcionat bé. Esperarem a veure si el podem tornar a connectar. Perquè bàsicament la idea és que ell faci una presentació, una mica d'aquest llibre, d'aquest recull d'articles que va escriure des del 2011 fins 2018, crec. I després passarem una ronda de preguntes que començaran el Joan, la Carme i l'Agus. Confiem poder-lo tenir coses de la tècnica i del directe. Aquestes fórmules híbrides de presencials i online en aquest temps de Covid. Si no fem xerrada aquí... Genera aquesta situació. Un de nosaltres fa de punk i l'altre. Aprofitem per criticar una altra cosa. Si considereu que ell està... I potser podríem aprofitar perquè... Sí? Podeu aprofitar, però jo crec que parlant amb... Ell no ens sé, no? I... Doncs aprofitem per fer-ho una mica abans de tenir... Ah, Pankaj, hi. Thank you. Ok. Thank you very much for the introduction, I'm sorry. It's ok. The floor is yours, please. I'm sorry, we're experiencing some technical difficulties, but anyway, I'm sure we'll overcome them. I'm very um, uh, delighted, actually, that you know, you're all able to come and to assemble here at the CCTB, one of my favorite venues in these very strange times. Um, the, the fact that we can still have these discussions and, and debates um, is, 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 is one sign um, that you know, whatever lies ahead in the future won't be <laughs> entirely discouraging that we have some resources, at least, to cope with this um, strange future that lies ahead. But anyway, um, I hope you can hear me all clearly, sure. uh, certainly much more clearly than uh, I could hear you. But I wanted to give a very brief introduction, then we can go straight into this um, discussion, which I'm very much looking forward to, uh, around my new book and around um, a series of arguments that I've made in this book and also elsewhere in, uh, in, in, in recent years. Um, very broadly speaking, what I've been trying to argue is that uh, we have grown up in an intellectual culture, and by we, let me, let me be very specific what I mean by we. Uh, it's, it's those of us who, first of all, grew up in post-colonial countries, uh, countries once occupied or colonized by uh, European and American powers. Uh, secondly, I mean those of us who work in English, who work in Anglophone cultures, uh, and whose concepts, whose ideas, whose assumptions are uh, in great, to a great extent derived 
from uh, the United States and Britain. Um, so this is the we that I'm, I'm, I'm referring to here, to, to, to in this context. And this we, this us, for a very long time has been working with concepts, with ideas and assumptions that are extremely out of date and need to be replaced and need to be restored uh, and need to be, need to be renovated um, by including the experiences of, well, the vast majority of the world's population, which is not living in the United States or Britain, which has had a completely different historical experience altogether, a very different experience of modernity on, on, on the whole. And um, I feel that reading, especially the uh, periodicals, the newspapers and magazines of England and America over the last two decades or so, um, what is very clear, what the, the fact that leaps out when, when reading these periodicals is that there has been a, a conceptual loss that people do not really have the concepts to describe what is happening in much of the world today. So for the last two decades, if you take the last two or three decades, the decades of globalization, we were assured by uh, people writing in these newspapers that the world was being knit together peacefully, largely peacefully, by Anglo-American prescriptions for capitalism, technology, uh, democracy. And this is all happening uh, with the United States in the leadership position. Um, and it was the United States historical duty in many ways to take people to this destination of American style modernity, American style democracy, American style capitalism. If you look at even Barack Obama's statements um, in, in, in the years while he was president and even afterwards, uh, the assumption is very, very strong. And today in the Biden administration, that assumption is very strong that we can go back to a time when American uh, and, and American ideas enjoyed um, hegemony around the world. Now for many of us elsewhere, this particular idea, this narrative was always very implausible and it didn't become implausible with the election of Donald Trump, but it had started to become implausible a long time ago. Uh, and, and, and there are certain events which clarified things enormously long before Trump was elected. And I here refer to the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Um, uh, then, of course, you had a period of intensified globalization, the ultimate winner of which was China. At the same time, the war on terror, an incredibly ambitious, audacious effort was uh, collapsing into various calamities. Then you had the financial crisis. Now, through all these different events, you can now look back and see that the world was moving into a completely different historical phase altogether. And that many of the ideas and assumptions that had been dominant for uh, decades now were becoming obsolete. So to give you an instance on people who were insisting that there is no alternative to American style, democracy and capitalism have no concepts with which to explain just how China, uh, country ruled by the Communist Party, a Communist Party, how did it become central to global networks of trade and finance? India, once hailed as the world's largest democracy, a great partner of, of the West uh, and, and, the, and, and, and possessing the world's fastest growing economy, how did India come to be ruled by Hindu fundamentalists, Hindu extremists, who are very explicitly inspired by European fascist movements of the 1920s and 30s. Most of all, there are very few concepts to explain uh, how within the heart of the modern West, populations 
angered by dysfunctional democracy and capitalism, started to vote for far-right demagogues. The other source of shock for many of the uh, uh, many in the Anglo-American intelligentsia has been the massive protests, the biggest uprising since the civil rights movement in the 1960s in the United States. Uh, Black Lives Matter, and these are, as we know, mass uprisings led by largely young people and powered by a new historical consciousness, just how slavery and racial capitalism underpinned the wealth and power of the United States and Britain. Now, of course, you know, Biden is, is, is uh, going to assume power. Um, in, uh, in early, um, uh, early next year. And there is talk of a restoration, there's talk of going back to uh, where we were before Trump was elected. But I think uh, it's imperative that we discard these kinds of fantasies. And you know, uh, 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 unless we make a very conscious attempt to interrogate these obsolete, outdated assumptions and ideas and to discard them, we will really not be able to again see what is happening in much of the world today. And um, I think one way of understanding, this is something I've tried to argue in many, many uh, publications. One way of understanding what is happening today will be to look at what started to happen in the mid 20th century, which is decolonization. Only if we understand decolonization will we understand the rise of China, will we understand the deeper structural changes of this new world that we are living in. Only then we can understand white supremacist upsurges in places like Britain and, 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 and the United States. Now, even during the Cold War, uh, which I think was a period when many of our leading ideas and assumptions were cemented. It was clear to, to, to many people during the Cold War that whatever happens in the future in the 21st century would be decided by what happens in places very remote geographically from Europe and America, where the vast majority of the world's population resides, rather than anything that people in England and America want to do. The Chinese revolution of 1949 always held greater consequences for the world than the Russian revolution. And when Mao Zedong said in 1949 that the Chinese people had stood up, this was not just some uh, boosterish rhetoric. Um, this was actually inaugurating this extensive calamitous, but ultimately incredibly successful pursuit of national wealth and power. To the extent where you look at uh, United States and, and Britain today, and you look at what is happening in these societies from deunionization to increased corporate clout, to extreme inequality, to white supremacist consolidation, none of these events can be explained without reference to the rise of China as a manufacturing giant and aggressively nationalist world power. In other words, we really, in order to understand where we are today, we have to discard many of the ideas and assumptions of the Cold War, and indeed the ideas and assumptions of the intellectual culture of imperialism. The reason why this task is so difficult is because the self-images, the modes of thought and perception developed during these previous decades in England and America are extremely tenacious. And, and I think particularly uh, became tenacious during the Cold War when the so-called free world was fighting, was engaged in a very intense ideological clash with the Soviet Union and its satellite states. And there was a constant overestimation of the free world during that time. Um, the, 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 the free world was credited with a kind of material, moral, and intellectual achievement 
that really could not be supported by historical facts. You know, to give you an instance, many young people today in their 20s, in their late teens, want to know how it became possible for white police officers to murder black people in broad daylight. It's a very innocent question in many ways, uh, but it's, the phenomena is so widespread, you know, people are compelled to ask that question. Uh, how is it possible to do that? How is it possible for armed militia men in the United States to assault anti-racist protesters, again, in broad daylight, with the consent of a sitting US president. Now, the accounts of the free world as a custodian of liberalism, of democracy, heir to the enlightenment and nemesis of totalitarianism, they were never gonna be of much help there. Um, they, 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 they suppress too much. They suppress the fact that in the end, it was the long centuries of global violence and dispossession that made Britain and the United States uniquely powerful and wealthy, and also underpinned their many, many assumptions. But the reason why this never became mainstream, one reason why young people ask these questions is because these things were never mentioned, mentioned or discussed at length. Of course, there was a lot of focus, a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, in, in fact, a great fixation with the crimes of people like Mao Zedong or Stalin, or, and, and indeed Hitler, but the fact that the wealth and power of the United States and Britain was also built upon a kind of systematic acquisitive violence, uh, ranging from genocide of indigenous populations to slavery. This, you know, is completely uncontroversial, these facts, but it was considered irrelevant or maybe impolite to mention them, to talk about them. And of course, you know, people who could talk about them, uh, people from places that the West had colonized in the past, were not really given a place in the mainstream. Uh, they were effectively silenced and marginalized. Now, of course, as I say in Bland Fanatics, there's a great correction at work. There are younger scholars dismantling old frameworks of thought and prejudice. A whole discussion is now being opened up, not just about imperialism, but also about anti-imperialism, the intellectual culture of anti-imperialism, of societies that first fought imperialism and then tried to modernize themselves and faced a series of problems uh, ranging from secessionist movements, religious extremism, demagogues, despotism. Their experience is also important today in understanding what is happening in, 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 in large parts of the world. And I mean, I think I, I should conclude here, but essentially what I've been trying to argue is that we should be listening a lot more to the victims of imperialist cultures, of imperialist societies, in order to understand why even the imperialist societies today are struggling to the extent that they are. Thank you. Thank you, Pankash. Um, ara em fe, faran un, un petit reset perquè, perquè funcioni, però havia pensat de donar-vos, mentre el tornem a tenir uh, en directe, donar-vos la paraula per introduir una mica uh, què és el que us ha portat aquest, aquest llibre i per, i per donar una mica també d'eines al públic per introduir la, la primera la pregunta, si et sembla, Joan. Sí. Uh, a mi m'ha suggerit, uh, no sé si la puc llegir el llibre, però és possible que sí, si l'heu llegit, us ha suggerit moltes coses en el llibre i parla de molts, de molts temes, tot i que hi ha unes grans línies, unes grans línies. Heu vist que és una acumulació de textos ja publicats en altres moments, que han, és, és com una corda trenada, no? hi ha diferents línies que pots veure que es van, es van reforçant l'una a l'altra. No? I jo una de les preguntes, la primera que li vull fer, és la de a veure si s'ha passat de, de rosca, per dir-ho així, si, si no ha acceptat massa el que suposa que és el seu adversari intel·lectual. No? Ell està criticant continuadament eh, la intel·ligència, la intel·ligència d'Occident, que ha anat anunciant una vegada i una altra al final de la història i el triomf de la democràcia liberal eh, que, que ha justificat el colonialisme, que ha justificat el descolonialisme, que ho ha justificat tot. Eh, 
I està comprant, d'alguna manera està acceptant la tesi segons la qual efectivament Occident està perdent l'hegemonia. I la meva pregunta va en la línia de... No vols dir que els acceptes aquests que justament també critiques la tesi que estan perdent l'hegemonia quan... Bé, hi ha moltes altres coses que et fan pensar que en realitat encara qui mana, encara qui mana i qui viu bé, que potser aquesta és la pregunta, no només qui mana, sinó que també qui viu bé en aquest món encara continua sent molt occident. Ves a saber si aquesta és una altra vegada una manera d'amagar la idea de la pèrdua d'hegemonia mundial d'Occident. Ves a saber si aquesta no és una altra, per què no tenia la sospita que aquesta és una altra manera d'ocultar una hegemonia, amagant justament sota la idea que estem perdent hegemonia, continuem tenint l'hegemonia. Jo començaria per aquí, simplement. Carme? Sí, estic. Bona tarda a tothom. Estic molt d'acord amb el que dius. Una mica em sembla molt interessant, i també és una de les coses que jo volia comentar amb ell, aquesta insistència amb la multiplicitat de veus, amb com han canviat les aportacions, el relat, la complexitat, però alhora hi ha una certa simplificació del que és el món anglosaxó o l'angloamericà, una mica més enllà, que també s'ha fet divers, complexa, i en aquest sentit sí que quan s'insisteix tant en aquesta pèrdua d'hegemonia, que jo sí que l'entenc en el sentit que no és com era en plena Guerra Freda, això no vol dir que no estiguem presenciant potser altres hegemonies o una nova també, una nova dualitat com la que teníem, potser amb actors diferents. Jo crec que en aquest sentit és interessant que parlaves d'aquesta simplificació que es fa amb Occident, si vols. Bé, que jo no sé si ell la fa, però jo crec que al final sí que té moltes corrents de pensament i que més des d'aquí sí que crec que hi ha una diversitat de cultures polítiques, etc. Però sí que el que sí que tinc clar és que passa al revés, el que ell diu al llibre també que parla d'un lloc de West and the rest. I de rest és... Àsia, Àfrica, Orient Mitjà, o sigui, això sí que és una gran simplificació i crec que aquest és un dels seus grans valors, que com a escriptor a més indi, que també coneixem tot i que no parla molt més d'Àsia que d'Occident, de fet la seva anàlisi sobretot es basa en l'Occident, diguem-ne, anglosaxó. Però crec que és interessant també anar una mica més enllà i quan parlem també d'anticolonialismes, etc., posar-hi també els seus diferents accents, perquè no és el mateix el que va passar a Àfrica a partir dels anys 40-50, que el que va passar a l'Índia, o vull dir que és molt interessant també aquesta anàlisi, jo crec que ell també equilibra molt bé en el seu llibre, en els seus articles, tot això. I que parteix fent crítica de l'Índia, no?, també. Això també és un tema, a mi m'interessa molt això, perquè l'Índia m'interessa molt, però això també és un tema llarg que, Clar, ell és molt crític amb l'actual govern de l'Índia, que és el partit que governa és el Bharata Janata Party, que és com Partit Popular de l'Índia, la traducció literal, i que és un partit hinduista. Ell és molt crític amb el govern, com Arundhati Roy també, i potser després li podem preguntar. Hi, Pankaj. Can you hear us? I can, indeed, thank you. Ok. Delighted to be here. Continuarem, doncs, si et sembla, li formules una mica amb aquesta introducció que ja has fet la pregunta, la pots fer en català, en castellà o en anglès, com vulguis, si prefereixes. En anglès. Hi, this is Joan Vergés, talking from Barcelona. Nice to meet you, it's a pleasure to be here and to have the chance to salute you and take part of this dialogue and conversation. I did enjoy very much uh, reading your book. Uh, I already, we already sent you something. I already uh, said to you that, well, I would start with the praise. I start with the praise uh, in the sense that I think this is a, a, an extraordinarily important book in the sense uh, uh, that it, it focuses our attention. It asks us to focus our attention on, a, a, I think, very important subject. Uh, I, I think my partners and colleagues here will share most of the uh, central tenets of your, of your book. But uh, since we are here in order to give uh, uh, way to a discussion, I will try to be uh, a little bit uh, more skeptical than I would be in I were uh, uh, totally sincere. Uh, so uh, in, in your book, you, you, you raise many issues. 
uh, I would say that one main issue is the cultural, moral, political and economic crisis of the, of the West. Uh, symptoms of this crisis are both the effective laws of world hegemony by the United Kingdom and the United States in recent decades, and also the constant lamentations about these laws of hegemony by a very notable part of the British and American intelligentsia. Uh, with, with respect to this uh, first symptom, the, the effective laws of world hegemony by the United Kingdom and the United States, you offer us little information, uh, at least in this book. Uh, uh, and you seem to take that for granted, that there is effectively a loss of world hegemony by the United States and, and Great Britain. However, uh, this is my question, my skepticism. Can we be sure about the analysis? Is the analysis correct? Uh, I mean, uh, aren't you buying their main, the, the, their first premise and uh, in that sense, aren't you already uh, uh, biting the, 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 the Trump uh, in the sense that uh, they, they prepared here something for us to believe in order for us to have a reaction? So uh, maybe, maybe we should first stop and uh, try to uh, consider whether that is true or not, because as you perfectly know, once one accepts the first premise, all the deduction, all the augmentation sometimes uh, follows from it. And uh, that, that's the first question. Yeah, thank you. Well, that, that's, a, that's a very important question. Um, what I would like to say, actually, in response is that um, what I've tried to do in this book and other writings, and this book consists of um, you know, essays written over a period of more than 10 years. Um, and I found myself, since I write for periodicals like the New York Times or the Guardian or um, the New York Review of Books and the New Yorker, all mainstream Anglo-American publications. And what I found myself doing while I'm writing for them is to actually push back against the dominant mainstream hegemonic tendencies within these journals, within their editors, within the people who write for them normally because I find myself in a unique position. You, don't, you won't find too many Indian writers in these magazines and, 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 and newspapers, uh, hardly any. You won't really find people from minority backgrounds writing for these magazines, very, 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 very few. So vast experience is you know, completely obscured in these, uh, in these periodicals. Now, uh, to come back to your question more directly, I think, and I say this in one of the pieces in the, in the book, is something very strange happened in Anglo-America. And by Anglo-America, I of course mean the United States and Britain, the two foremost imperialist powers, the most powerful countries of the last 200 years. That even as they started to decline, and I think we can date their decline, their material decline to the 1970s, which is the crisis of Britain decade, uh, the oil shocks, uh, and now we know that wages started to stagnate back in the mid 70s in, in, in the United States. Uh, many of the sources of uh, current political problems can be traced back to that time when for large numbers of Americans, life suddenly did not seem as dynamic as it had been in the 50s and 60s. But even while they started to materially decline, and of course they started to cover up their decline. There were various ways of doing that, you know, partly by extending credit to large parts of the population that had not experienced credit before to the same extent. Um, in the 90s, 2000s, when China began to rise, when large parts of Asia started to also develop materially, economically, and Anglo-America went into this period of decline that we now you know, see much, much more clearly, um, the hegemonic power of Anglo-America started to rise at the same time. So you had the strange uh, uh, disjunction whereby a country is started to materially decline and started to experience or started to germinate various political problems in their midst. At the same time, you have an elite, an intellectual elite, which is dominant in its mainstream periodicals. 
and which is peddling this idea that American modernity or American democracy or American capitalism, or to, more specifically, Reagan Thatcher models were the models for the rest of the world to follow and to imitate, even as those models were starting to collapse internally. So this is the strange distinction. This is why many of these newspapers and periodicals are suffering what I call the conceptual loss. Uh, they just don't know how to make sense of the world that we are uh, living in today. So uh, their peak of hegemony, of intellectual hegemony, has coincided with a series of political earthquakes. You know, it's the financial crisis, the failed war on terror, uh, finally the election of Trump, a calamity like Brexit. And uh, at the same time, they are in these positions of power, but still telling the rest of the world how to order their economies, how to order their societies. And yet they cannot make sense of what is happening internally within their own countries. They cannot explain how China suddenly became so powerful, so dominant, even though it's a place run by a communist party that has been in power uninterruptedly since, since, uh, since 1949. So I think that, is, uh, that, that sort of strange disjunction struck me uh, as I was writing. And I think, again, going back to your question more directly, I would say that until the pandemic, uh, there were still people arguing that, ah, uh, you know, in a way we can still go back to where we were before Brexit and before Donald Trump. But the pandemic um, has really in a way destroyed many of those possibilities. It'll take a long time for both countries to recover from it, uh, socially as well as economically. Uh, I think the thing to look out for in the United States in particular would be a kind of social breakdown. Um, and I think the closed, the very close results of the U US election, close not you know, numerically, of course, Biden won many, many more votes than Trump, but I think the result in some states, the way the system is, the results are decided there, it was close enough and many, many more people voted for Trump than you know, most people had expected. Um, it just means that the, the phenomenon that Trump represented um, is gonna be with us for some time. And that is going to become a major hurdle in any kind of reconstruction or any kind of reconsolidation that happens. So in other words, the facts of material decline now cannot be denied. Uh, they are there plainly staring at us in the face uh, in both countries. And uh, you know, we haven't even spoken about the cost of Brexit to uh, Britain. Um, I, you know, previously, you had to sort of you know, say that this is really a problem, the war on terror has failed, the financial crisis is a calamity, but you couldn't really point to, because you know, the way the whole thing was, the whole intellectual culture was structured, um, you could really couldn't point to too much evidence. Now the evidence is before us, the fact that Brexit empowered a whole lot of far right um, individuals and personalities in Britain, the fact that uh, growing inequality, uh, dysfunctional political system ended up empowering a figure like Donald Trump in the United States. I think now the evidence is before us um, and it's very hard to deny that the so-called makers of the modern world are in very serious trouble right now. And one reason why they are in serious trouble is because they were blinded, they were misled by their own ideas and assumptions. Yes, good afternoon, and it's also a pleasure to, to be with you, even if it's online uh, for this discussion. So my question is more or less related to what you were mentioning in, in Great Britain. So there is an idea repeated through the book, through different chapters, of this new complexity and this new multiplicity of voices that have been taking ground also in the public discussion, uh, and how this has been challenged, this self-granted hegemony for, for the Anglo-American world that you were mentioning. But at the same time, we are also witnessing um, how this uh, complex identity has become every time more and more difficult to explain itself, how it has become easier to define identities by opposition. So it's easier to say what we are not more than what we are, 
and how this has been also feeding this nativism. And you were mentioning how Brexit feed uh, far right in, in the UK. So how can this complex identity and this complex ideological uh, new present to answer this nativism? Well, I think, you know, um, and again, one has to go back to the fact of imperialism. I mean, certainly in the case of Britain, it's very apparent that today Scotland uh, now explicitly wants to break away from the United Kingdom. Um, Wales, not so sure. Um, maybe they'll, you know, have a rethink about this. Um, Ireland, I mean, long time that that break happened. Um, the United Kingdom as an entity really made sense and made sense for a very long time, as long as Britain was an incredibly successful imperialist power. The Scots were very much partners in that imperialist project. And, um, you know, obviously they benefited from it, some of them at least. Um, now that Britain is no longer, not, not only not an imperialist power, but not even a global power, uh, that reliance, that relationship between Edinburgh and London has frayed and is going to fray even further. So what we are looking at is a country, its political culture, its intellectual culture, underpinned by its global strength, by its global power. And once that power goes away, the country starts to fall apart. And in order to create new forms of unity, political unity, people will, politicians, of course, will turn to demonizing, vilifying particular minorities, you know, the Brexit, during the Brexit campaign, the big, the, the big sort of winning slogan was that uh, 70 million Turks are coming to England. Uh, they're all going to be members of the EU and they're all going to be taking over Britain. This was actually a serious slogan uh, with a lot of political consequence. Uh, we know about uh, Islamophobia, we know about uh, people like Nigel Farage, uh, we know about the upsurge of English nationalism. Now, English nationalism was, was never a force in Britain. Uh, it, it, it really did not exist. Now, it has arisen partly in response to uh, Scottish nationalism, but also because politicians need a mass base for English nationalism. They need to define themselves, as you put it, against an enemy, whether that's an internal enemy or an external enemy. Again, I mean, I think a lot of these questions were uh, uh, answered during the Cold War when there was a big enemy uh, with whom you were locked in, in a nuclear standoff and you define yourself as part of the free world. You had a particular identity, you had a political identity, you had a national identity. Now, all that is gone. The Cold War is over. Russia, you can turn it into a threat, but it'll never be the same threat that the Soviet Union supposedly was once upon a time. Um, Muslims, Islam, uh, Turks, uh, one after the other, there are various enemies that are put in this position whereby they act as a foil, uh, one way of defining yourself. But you know, this is, this is essentially the frustrated quest of a country whose traditional basis for defining itself have, 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 have collapsed. And you know, to a large extent, you can also argue this is what is happening in the United States, where as long as it was expanding, it did not really need to worry too much about its national identity, uh, this, this particular unity that Donald Trump has been, has been, has been going on about. There's a, there's a quote from, the British imperialist Cecil Rhodes that I, you know, um, uh, uh, quote in, in Bland Fanatics, which is that if you want to avoid civil war, become an imperialist. So as long as you're expanding, occupying other people's uh, land, uh, appropriating their resources, bringing them home, creating prosperity within your midst, um, you can keep at bay all these divisions, all these conflicts that exist at home. You can resolve them, or even if you don't resolve them, you can keep them simmering. You, don't, you can prevent them from exploding. But the moment you stop expanding, the moment you stop being a successful imperialist power, uh, then you are in, 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 in trouble. And this is the case with countries that have defined themselves as hugely successful makers of 
the modern world. So, Mr. Misha, it's an honor to share this platform with you. I don't know if you can see me here, or I don't know which the camera, but <laughs> here? Yes, okay. I can. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, my name is Agus Morales. I'm a journalist, so I will ask you a straight question. Uh, <laughs> uh, you discuss in your book, uh, in your articles, about uh, the pervading crisis literature, like uh, books about men, civilization, the end of the West, no? Uh, and at the end of this, uh, at these books, you can find this anxiety. I don't know if uh, that's the word. That's the first question. If that's the word that you would use, this anxiety uh, of 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 the West. And if so, uh, my question is: this anxiety is it perpetual, or is it, does it come from an analysis of the situation that we were, you were saying before, or what is it? Is it typical of of late imperialism? or capitalism, where does it come from, this anxiety of, of the West? I think it's actually, I, I think it's typical of imperialism in general, of modern imperialism in general, which is uh, underconfident because unlike, you know, the imperialisms of the past, uh, Roman or Ottoman or Mughal or Qing, um, they were relatively confident imperialisms and they were not accompanied by any kind of great moral rhetoric about how we are uplifting the natives, how we are civilizing the natives. They were you know, often just interested in straightforward appropriation uh, and, and, and conquest. But with modern imperialism, there's a guilty conscience that accompanies this imperialism, this process of violence and dispossession. Um, there's an awareness that we are actually stealing from other people. We are, we are stealing their land, we're stealing their resources. And along with that, there is the awareness that those people one day will want their due share of the world's richness that we are right now stealing from them. And so right from the late 19th century onwards, the period of imperialism's most you know, hectic, it's the most hectic period in uh, modern imperialism, uh, you see this rise of what you call uh, uh, anxiety literature that the colored peoples are rising. The colored peoples were all at that point completely suppressed. Uh, the Chinese, the Japanese, uh, they hadn't even started to construct modern nations or militaries or navies or anything like that. But uh, the white countries were paralyzed with fear that these countries are all going to be rising uh, one day and going to take our position. So that fear, that anxiety that you speak of, you know, which you now see manifest more broadly, was already there in the late 19th century. You know, someone like Woodrow Wilson, the, the American president, sort of openly talks about how we can only uh, maintain white civilization and its, and its dominance over the, over the planet if we go to war in Europe. Uh, we have to fight that war. These are the reasons he's giving. I mean, he was, of course, a very a notorious white supremacist, but even those who did not identify themselves as a white nationalist uh, were also uh, suffused with this fear. Uh, and there were books written at the time, you know, the rise of the colored peoples, um, some, some, you know, uh, 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 the, the, the periodicals of the time are full of this language of uh, race war, uh, how you know the Muslims are rising, they're becoming more assertive, they're becoming more aggressive, on and on and on. I think uh, there was a period, I mean, I think after the, after, after the Holocaust, 19, 19, 1945, when Nazi crimes were revealed, that this kind of rhetoric became taboo. Uh, you, we, we, we all realized that this you know, can go into a very nasty, a very vicious direction, this kind of talk about white supremacism or racial ethnic supremacism in general. Uh, so for the last you know, many decades, we were relatively free. Our political cultures, our, our civil societies, public spheres were relatively free of this kind of discord. But now they've become, you know, again, very, very commonplace. Uh, now what has actually happened is that the actual decline that people were fearing back in the late 19th century and in the early 20th century uh, it was mostly a, a you know, fantastical fear, has now become real, has now become real in the sense that China is now a major power. And so, you know, the crisis uh, literature, 
is proliferating, uh, you know, more and more volumes are being added to it all the time, of course. And of course, newspapers, WhatsApp, conspiracy theories, alternative, uh, you know, news outlets, they're all feeding that anxiety all the time. Jo crec que ara estem a un nivell de la conversa, no? que tots ens preguntem on i nosaltres on som amb tot aquest, que no? com a europeus, on estem? Estem dins, estem fora d'aquest món anglosaxó dominant? Anàvem per aquí una mica les preguntes, no? Joan? Sí. Uh, bé, yes. well, una of the, the, the things I, I thought about reading your book was, was uh, you talk about the West, mainly, uh, and... Uh, there is a part of the West which is not the central, it's not at the center of the West. There are parts of the West which are the rest of the West. You, 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 you make, you take advantage of this distinction between the West and the rest, but within the West we have, there are plenty of areas where the logics that dominates, that uh, characterize the center, the, the city in London or or Wall Street in, in New York, uh, are, are, are actually not in place. And my question would be the following. Do you think there is any hope in those uh, border places, west areas, although areas close to other, let's say, uh, cultures, ways of living, or non-Western ways of uh, understanding the world, do you think there are uh, precisely hope in uh, finding an alternative in those places where Samuel Huntington says, he says, there, in those places, in those borders uh, where civilizations clash, there, conflict will take place. So my question would be kind of the reverse. Isn't, the, I don't know, it's simply, this is a worry. Uh, but don't you think that maybe hope is there precisely where conflict will take place because of this experience of having different ways of understanding. Uh, I mean, we Catalans, we Spaniards, we are not part of uh, the city, we are not part of Wall Street. We may even be characterized as, in main part, uh, victims of uh, some logics uh, in, in these processes. But, uh, and we can sympathize with other, other ways of, uh, other cultures being exploited. And, and so uh, I don't know whether this makes any sense for you, because, well, uh, this is a question. Yes. No, no, absolutely. I mean, I think that's a very important question and goes to the heart of what I've been trying to argue in various uh, publications, which is that when I speak of Anglo-America, and I think I speak generally of Anglo-America, not of the West, I speak of Britain and the United States, and in many pieces, and including uh, uh, some included in the new book, I'm, I, I'm very careful to distinguish the experience of these two countries, which is the experience of success, which is the experience of domination, very successful domination, and you know, uh, extensive exploitation of various resources around the world, and indeed various populations in terms of slavery. Now, uh, that modern experience is really only confined, that experience of unbroken, unprecedented success, is confined to people living in these two countries. And even then, only some people living in these countries, not, 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 not all of them. When we look at Germany, when we look at Spain, when we look at Italy, we are looking at latecomers, latecomers to modernity. We, countries that started to modernize, industrialize, very late compared to, say, Britain, United States, and France, I would include in that, in that category. And coming to, or looking at Europe from a place like India, I've often wondered why India or why intellectuals in India do not look at the German social model for inspiration. Why don't we look at how the Germans have organized their social market economy, uh, the way they have uh, 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 representatives of labor on, 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 on corporate boards, how the ways they have tried to tackle inequality, the ways they've tried to create a federal structure uh, within, within, uh, within the country. Why do we have to look at Britain and the United States 
for inspiration and examples. But this is an, an example of the hegemony that I'm talking about. If you, if you grow up in an English speaking country, uh, those are the cultures you look up to. Those are the cultures that you, you know, derive your ideas and assumptions from. And that is precisely the hegemony that I was speaking of earlier, you know, constructed not only by the Financial Times or the New York Times or the Guardian, uh, but also by institutions, by the IMF, by the World Bank, by think tanks in Washington, D.C. and London, the whole network of them, by politicians, by powerful businessmen. Um, and all the experiences of these other countries, whether it's Germany or Spain or Scandinavia, another, you know, uh, a part of the world with a very different social model altogether. I mean, there's hardly any comparison to be made between, say, the social model of, of Norway and the social model of the United States. Um, so you're right. The West consists of many, many different experiences. In fact, the West is now an incoherent entity because the diversity of the West is so clear, is so manifest before us. The West was a shorthand during the Cold War to mark off the free world uh, and to define it vis-a-vis -vis Soviet communism or communist states. That distinction doesn't work anymore because those conflicts are not there anymore. So we have to be more specific and to be more precise. Um, but then I think the essential task actually is to challenge and break the intellectual hegemony of Anglo-America. Without that, I think we will not be able to examine the specific cultural, social, economic experiences of countries like, of, of, of countries like Spain. We will not be able to learn from them. And I think it's a big loss for countries elsewhere, because they share in many ways the same experience of trying to catch up, trying to create a, a, you know, a, a, a society with you know, a, a sort of relatively high amounts of equality and social peace. Uh, what kind of economic models should we follow for that? What kind of you know, uh, uh, political structures should we have? Uh, I think we are looking at a very poor, a very impoverished imagination if our examples are limited to just the United States and Britain, whose you know, experiences are unrepeatable. They're unrepeatable because they are the experiences of imperialism. I mean, what can India do in order to become an imperialist power today? Nothing at all. Uh, so it's, 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 it's pointless trying to imitate their uh, uh, examples. It's much more pragmatic and sensible for a country like India to look at countries that have, you know, big agrarian economies um, that are not fully industrialized, that are not fully modern. You know, a country like Spain and Italy, uh, in many ways, with their religious populations, with their conservative, uh, uh, you know, populations, uh, with their relatively, you know, pretty well-developed agricultural economies, there actually there's a lot more to learn from, and 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 and, and you know. For, for, for countries in Asia and Africa. So those links need to be strengthened, but we're not gonna strengthen them. If you are constantly mediating our conversations through London and New York, um, you know, I mean, I think some of the uh, people who come to CCBB from, from, from Asia and Africa talk about these issues. And then there is of course, you know, direct conversation like the one we are having right now, but otherwise how few opportunities do we actually have to create those kinds of platforms? Um, I wanted to ask you about this idea of confronting models or, or systems, um, because you, you're mentioning, right, that, that the ideological clash of the Cold War doesn't exist anymore, um, but we tend to explain the world from a confrontation still, and um, there is a lot about the rising of China in, in the book and how democracy in the West has been hollowed out, as, as you put it also in your own words. But at the same time, um, I have the feeling that the US, um, through this new technological confrontation that they are living with China, they repeat the same model of explaining the world as a binary choice where you have to choose between capitalism from Silicon Valley or the techno-autocracy of China. And, uh, and then again, forcing India, South Korea, the, the, the European Union to take sides. So even if these old clashes doesn't exist anymore, they are still building new clashes to, to justify themselves or to give them a, a narrative to themselves, maybe. 
No, that's absolutely right. I mean, I think, um, you know, what President Eisenhower said back in the 1950s, just when the Cold War was starting, he warned against the rise of a military industrial complex in the United States that would dictate too much the shaping of domestic and foreign policy. What he forgot to mention was also the rise of the intellectual industrial complex, whereby you have an entire industry of people essentially creating binary choices, of dividing up the world into zones, of essentially forcing all their thinking into binary oppositions. And you know, that is what we are still looking at today, uh, whether it's the think tanks in Washington DC, whether it's the newspapers, uh, they're all deeply invested, not just individually, but industrially uh, into this particular notion of the world where there are only these two choices uh, to, be, to be made all the time. So it's a real trap. It's a real intellectual trap. I, I really don't know how a country like the United States emerges from it, you know, apart from you know, the possibility that young people who've not grown up in that system and who have grown up with a very different political reality, which is that of the failed war on terror, of George W. Bush, of Hurricane Katrina, financial crisis. And now, you know, Trump will look at the world with somewhat fresh eyes. But when we look at generations, uh, you know, of people older than 40, people in their 50s and 60s, they really set in their ways, uh, the way they look at the world, um, it's really incredibly one dimensional and incredibly sterile. And they don't even realize that. You know, that this, is the, this is the extraordinary thing that they don't realize that they don't actually possess much information about large parts of the world. Uh, what they've really done is neatly divide up the world in, as you say, it's a Silicon Valley way to go, or you look at um, you know, the authoritarian model of, 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 of China. Um, they just simply won't change that analysis, even when it is proved that the United States really is not the democracy it is supposed to be. The United States is, you know, in many ways, a, a, a dysfunctional society, both politically and economically. And yet they persist with this, you know, opposition between democracy and authoritarian view. So, uh, Mr. Mishra, I think also we need to sell some of your copies, some copies of your book here. So I'm going to ask you about the title, no? Uh, you, you are now discussing about uh, this bipolar situation. Or, so I want to ask you who is to blame about this uh, uniformization of ideas, no? I, I don't know if these bland fanatics or this, I think the liberal bland fanatics, now that you speak of uh, in, the, in, the, in the book, you also say that they have no nose for democracies to true enemies. So I, I want to ask you also, who are democracy real enemies in, in your opinion? I don't know if it's white supremacy or I don't know what's your, your take. Uh, white supremacy is a symptom of a, of a, of a bigger, much bigger problem. Um, and I think the problem is inequality. Um, democracy's biggest enemy really is inequality because democracy fundamentally is a promise of equality and dignity. And the fact of inequality, and particularly the grotesque levels of inequality that we see or have seen uh, in the United States and, 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 and Britain in recent decades, uh, is something that in the end forces many, many people, significant parts of the population, to really, in many ways, assume a nihilistic outlook. Uh, towards life, towards the world in general. I mean, I really think that the number of people voting for Trump, despite the fact that in four years, uh, he proved himself to be utterly unfit for his high office in a variety of ways, you know, uh, the way he spoke, the way he conducted policy, the way he fired people at will. Um, there's just, absolutely no way of denying the fact that this man was really a, a, a moral calamity in many ways. And yet more than 70 million people voted for him. And of course they voted for him back in 2016. And I really think uh, there's a kind of desire for change in both Britain and the United States, uh, 
which is being repeatedly frustrated, a desire for dignity, desire for equality. And when that is re repeatedly frustrated, and this has also happened in, in, in the country that I come from, in India, people turn to demagogues, people turn to politicians who promise to blow the whole place up, who promise to defy every rule in the book, who promise to mock, to demonize, to stigmatize, who essentially inject you know, a, a kind of nihilistic poison into the, into the mainstream, because the mainstream has such, become such an object of loathing for many people. They like someone like Trump uh, denouncing it or, 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 or denouncing the liberal establishment, the old elites, and they continue to vote for such figures. So in that, that sense, I feel like inequality is a deeper problem, is that if you betray the promise of democracy, which is fundamentally equality, then you are essentially creating the ground for the kind of um, extreme uh, right-wing fundamentalist extremist movements and personalities that we've seen in, in recent decades. Faríem una última ronda, so que us han quedat coses al tinter. Joan? Uh, moltes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a last brief and brief. easy question. Uh, what is, uh, in, in your opinion, uh, in, in, and in partly going back to this idea of hope and alternatives, uh, uh, in, in your opinion, what is first, materialism or idealism? Material or ideas, uh, so to speak. I, I, imagine you have uh, just a, a limited budget in order to change the world. Uh, you are given scarce resources, but you are allowed to, to, uh, to make use of these resources and they will have an effect. So imagine you can uh, buy uh, intellect ideas and change uh, uh, world dominance ideas. On the other hand, uh, you could invest this in factories or uh, streets and infrastructures. Where would you? Where would you put the, the budget? Sorry about the question, I know it. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, I, it's an interesting question um, because I think you know, we, we tend to assume that uh, material growth is uh, endless and that it is potentially available to all. But I think the big idea that has checked that and it's still an idea, many people don't believe in that idea, uh, but it's nevertheless there, which is that Climate change puts a necessary limit on material growth. So I think to answer your question, we really in many ways cannot pursue material growth or materialism without now being aware that our desires or aspirations have a built-in limit, which is that the earth itself cannot provide for all of us, certainly in, in, in the way we want to consume, in the way we want material things, uh, that the Earth's resources are necessarily limited. So in that sense, I mean, I think uh, idealism of the kind that people like Greta Thunberg, uh, you know, who's a very young person, express has become more important than the previous notion that all nations can have a share of this great consumer economy created by the United States and that we will all aspire to uh, the living standards enjoyed by some Americans, you know, two cars in the garage. At least that was a fantasy we all grew up with in India and in, indeed in China, uh, that we're all gonna be, you know, having uh, two cars in the garage, uh, employment with a factory, uh, vacations uh, in Disneyland. Um, Unfortunately, it turns out that those fantasies are not realizable. Um, and even if they are reali realizable, for some people, they ha carry a big cost uh, to the environment. Uh, and also it turns out they are, they are politically unsustainable in many ways because you know, once only some people get those benefits and other people don't, then you're gonna create uh, more resentment, more anger against the political system. Uh, and, and create again uh, a scope for various kinds of uh, demagogues. Uh, 
So I feel the return of idealism amongst young people is a great development. And I feel like, you know, it is something that um, we can invest our hope in right now. Um, the, the decades during which we invested hope in some mechanical process of globalization, of accumulation, of acquisition, of growth. Um, I feel like many, many of those decades were a time of delusion. Uh, we were kind of sleepwalking our way to progress, not realizing that progress is you know, simply not happening for, for large numbers of people. I will be very short and just following this line because I, I agree with your mention and maybe we are witnessing an opportunity um, because of this change among young people and, and how feminism and climate change is mobilizing, but not only in, in Western societies and we can see protests all over the world and some connections among them. So how can this make the mainstream evaluate or how can this have a change in the political views? Well, I think it's going to be very difficult. Um, I really feel like it's going to be very difficult because I think there are two generations, older generations, that are very entrenched in positions of power in politics. You know, I mean, most politicians in, you have a very young prime minister, but you know, you look at Britain, uh, you look at the United States, so many politicians are, you know, older people uh, with very little experience, with very little in common with you know, the experiences of a vast majority of their, of their populations. So uh, as long as you have this older generations in, in positions of power and influence in politics and media and business, it's going to be very difficult to change mentalities. Um, but I think, you know, in, in, in the ways young people have come together to politically mobilize and organize is actually really interesting. Uh, very fascinating. And I think that might actually over time produce results because in the end, it's only through political struggle, it's only through intellectual contention that we are going to, you know, arrive somewhere that we want to really arrive at. Um, and, you know, in that sense, I think the last few years of protests and, and, and demonstrations and movements led by young people, even in Spain and, you know, uh, and, and other countries, I think have been hugely promising. I mean, many, many poor people have become politicized. You know, I have a daughter who's 12 years old, who's already much, much more intensely political than I was at her age, or even when I was older. You know, and I grew up in, in, a, in, a, in a relatively poor country where everyone was politicized to a certain extent. So I think that is, you know, uh, extremely promising the way young people are today posing a challenge to the authority of older entrenched uh, generations. I, I feel that something good is going to come out of this particular challenge because really the problem has been that this, these two generations have not been challenged at all in the last uh, many decades. They've suffered, they've now suffered adversity, but they've not really you know, faced any kind of serious intellectual and moral challenges. And so how do you build this kind of alternative thought? In the sense that before you were saying also that um, Anglo-American culture is like mediating us, like uh, different cultures to communicate between each other, they have to go through it, through their ideas, even, even through language, because for instance, for me, if I want to read a, I don't know, a Bengali writer, uh, I get the translation, it comes from Bengali to English, from English to Spanish. So even in that sense, so my question is, how do you build this, this, this bridge of, of ideas, of, of communication, how, how, how do you build it? Well, I mean, you know, I think the institution that we are, that is right now mediating uh, our conversation, uh, I think we need more of them, you know, it's, 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 it's very simple in many ways, um, institutions that bypass uh, these, you know, much, much more complex routes of communication and open up a kind of direct dialogue. Um, again, you know, um, I think in many ways, digital media uh, has made it possible uh, for uh, very, very unique forms of communications to take place today. Um, and I think in that sense, you know, I, I don't think we have to sort of think very, very hard about what 
uh, we can do to expedite these new conversations and these, these new discussions, because we do have some examples around us um, of people already talking and communicating. But I, I, I think it's really, in that sense, it's, it's important to um, be aware that there is really a serious problem. I mean, one of, the, one of the challenges that I face in my own work writing mostly in English, mostly in uh, English and American um, periodicals is that there is very little awareness that there is a problem. And you just don't know how to solve a problem. You cannot solve a problem unless you're even aware that there is a problem. Um, those of us who are from elsewhere, from outside can see it and see the problem very clearly and work to address it. But anyway, I mean, as I said, I think it's important to actually sometimes bypass the big, uh, you know, sort of, as it were, the big centers of intellectual hegemony and to conduct conversations on different platforms altogether. Thanks, Pankaj. Obrirem un torn de preguntes. Crec que potser n'hi cabran una o dues. No sé si algú aquí al públic té, té alguna pregunta. Hi ha un micròfon allà. No? Ningú? Si no, donem una altra... Allà, allà hi ha una persona que voldria dir... Aquí, estupend. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, can I take the mask off? No, okay. All right. Um, no, this question actually just arose now. We were talking about how do we build these bridges, right? And... Um, it was really interesting, like, this conversation for me because it drew on different topics. Like, we are in the periphery of the West here. Um, we speak another language. And I've lived in Asia many years, and then I came back to Europe. And I think that, for me, I, I would like to know <laughs> your opinion also. I think learning other languages is paramount. Also, languages far away from ours, Chinese or Thai, the case of European people, or even just other European languages. I think this is central. And um, the other thing that really struck me in this whole conversation was what you were mentioning about older generations being really fixed in their ways. Uh, it made me think of Francis Fukuyama, you know, the end of history, 1989. Uh, this generation still thinks that way. So, in my opinion, I think that the force of young people might be that they are more exposed to the other, more. Like, my, my life experience is the life experience of many. So do you think that could be useful in creating bridges, pushing young people to live really far away for more? Oh, I think that's absolutely right. Um, there's, no, there's no question that young people today are exposed to a far broader range of, you know, uh, experiences, both, you know, in their own lives and also virtually, um, they are exposed to, you know, a, a very wide range of ideas and assumptions. And I think in that sense, they've kind of broken free already of the very limited, narrow, often very parochial notions that say people of Fukuyama's generation uh, would have grown up with. Um, they had very little exposure, real exposure to other countries or other cultures and societies. And I think one, one thing that you know has happened in recent um, decade and a half is that you know you've have you've have uh, serious problems, of course, with social media and digital media in general, uh, fake news and so on. But you know, for people who can use these tools. Um, with particular, you know, aims, particular uh, ends in mind, they can also learn a whole lot about what is happening in the world today, uh, how people conduct their societies or conduct their lives in different parts of the world. So knowledge is widely available in a way it wasn't, you know, when I was growing up in, in India. So that's why I said, you know, my, my young daughter is far more mature um, politically and intellectually than I was at even in my in my in my late teens. So there's already a massive leap being made by uh, younger people today. 
I think the point about languages is also very important. You know, I, I've set myself a task, you know, um, that it's not enough for me to know the languages that I know. I also need to learn others. In fact, I'm, uh, I've set myself a task it started a month ago that I'm going to be learning Spanish um, because I want to read, I can visit Spain often, I read Spanish writers, but often in translation. You know, it's be, be nice to be able to have this conversation with you all in Spanish. Um, you know, we are, here we are speaking in, in, in English and perhaps, the, you know, uh, our words, our discussions will reach a broader audience if I'm able to speak in Spanish. So learning language is absolutely hugely important. Thanks, Pankaj. No sé si hay alguna otra pregunta del público. How about now? Yeah. Um, I haven't read your book, so I'm asking a question mostly based on what I've heard. And um, in case you can't see me, as a black indigenous person who's from the U.S., but whose family is also sort of displaced and being forced to be in the U.S., I find that white supremacy, southern colonialism, anti-blackness is the fabric of American society. So I guess I find it almost not cynical, maybe that's not the right word, but almost naive that people think that it's surprising that we don't kind of think about the U.S. this way or are surprised by, um, I don't know, the resurgence number 5,000 of white nationalism. So my question to you is, are people really surprised or are they willfully avoiding the problem? Because, I mean, my opinion is that they're, they, we, whomever, however we want to frame it, are constantly purposefully pretending that we had no idea that this is happening, but it's always been happening. So that's, yeah, that's my question. Do you, do you actually think people are surprised or being, I don't know, living in cognitive dissonance? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, some people are obviously surprised because nothing in their education, nothing in the books they read, in the movies they saw, in the television documentaries they saw, told them that this is actually, as you correctly put it, is the bleak reality of uh, American society. That genocide, uh, slavery, uh, racial politics, racial othering have always been a feature of that particular society and have always been dominant. Uh, the other thing, which is you know, what uh, people hold up, uh, that we're all achieving or trying to achieve some kind of perfect union, uh, that has always been on the back foot, uh, that's always been on the defensive, that particular tendency. I think the reality has been far harsher and bleaker. But I feel that, you know, certainly people who should know better have suppressed it, have ignored it, and they have also marginalized people who could have educated uh, American society about these realities. Uh, there's been a very effective campaign of censorship. Uh, speaking of cancel culture, you know, people have generally been canceled for speaking the truth in the past um, because that truth did not conform with the cherished images of American society. Many people have. Uh, people speaking those truths were stigmatized. Uh, they were, in many cases, driven into exile. Uh, you know, forced to leave the United States. Uh, there are so many instances of uh, African-American writers and activists uh, who were forced to leave. So I think uh, there has been a very systematic campaign of suppression, um, but at the same time, I think there are people who are genuinely ill-educated in these matters uh, because of the way uh, the intellectual and political culture is constituted, where a whole lot of propaganda and falsehoods are being disseminated all the time, you know, the founding fathers were great uh, 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 freedom uh, fighters and that they were all interested in happiness and liberty for all. They were a bunch of slave owners. Uh, but I think these simple facts um, have been very, very carefully and systematically suppressed. Uh, and so I think for many people, it comes as a huge shock 
to suddenly realize that these were the realities all along and they just simply weren't made aware of them. Okay, thanks, Pankaj. Mm, we're just finishing. Jo només voldria afegir una última reflexió. El dia 20 de gener hi tindrem nou president als Estats Units. Eh, I vostè dedica tot un capítol al Niall Ferguson, un um, analista, en direm, escocès, que viu als Estats Units i que recentment en, una, en un diari d'aquest país va dir que els demòcrates sí, havien guanyat les eleccions, però no havien entès la raó per la qual Donald Trump va guanyar fa quatre anys i que, per tant, no havia servit gaire de res aquesta victòria de Joe Biden. Què, què n'espera vostè dels pròxims quatre anys de presidència demòcrata als Estats Units? Algun revulsiu? Um, I think, you know, any government, uh, no matter who is president or what party is in power, the scale of the problems in the United States uh, is so unmanageable right now that failure is almost uh, foreordained. You know, it's, 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 it's the most predictable thing right now. Uh, there is no way uh, a US president can emerge from this mess right now in a strong position four years from now. Uh, it's just, you know, it's, we are looking at really a catastrophic sort of breakdown. So I feel I have very little hopes from this new administration. And, you know, so far nothing uh, Biden has done has made me think differently. Uh, the kind of people he has assembled, um, you know, intellectually, not inspiring at all. Um, a whole lot of people who've served previous administrations, a whole lot of human pinstripes, you know, nothing distinctive or intellectually interesting about them at all. And we need really fresh thinking at this time to deal with this catastrophic crisis. And Biden himself and the people around him simply do not have the intellectual power and authority that is needed right now. So I have no great hopes from this administration at all. Difícil. <laughs> <laughs> acabar, és, no és un missatge molt optimista per acabar aquesta, aquesta xerrada. En tot cas, sí que li agraïm moltíssim. Thank you very much, Pankaj. I don't know if you would like to add something more positive at the end, just closing <laughs> the speech. You see, no, can, I, can I add something more? Sure. Um, sure. Would, you, would you like to add something more? Just to finish. Oh, yes. to close. Oh, I think what I want to say is that, you know, I, I don't think we should have our own moods uh, and ideas and our hopes from the future be dictated too much by what happens in the United States. I feel like, you know, we are inhabiting different political realities and our struggles are essentially local struggles. Uh, the United States is dealing with a, you know, a breakdown of its own propaganda systems, uh, a social breakdown, a political breakdown, an economic breakdown. Other societies, you know, they have troubles, they have problems, but not on that scale. And I see no reason why people in Europe or people in large parts of Asia should become so concerned by the fate of the United States. Uh, I think we should separate ourselves a little bit from the political situation there. I mean, I find it very strange, you know, like English newspapers, everything that happens in the United States is on the front page. Why? Uh, it's not of importance to most people in, 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 in the country what's going on uh, within the Democratic Party. What, of what relevance is it to most people in Europe? Um, why do we monitor this so closely? Why do we let our own emotions be dictated? Obama wins, everyone celebrates in Europe. Why exactly? I mean, we can see that that did very little for Europe, uh, Obama's election. Trump, yes, you know, he, he broke off the transatlantic alliance, but that was, you know, uh, uh, already extremely frail. You know, there are, there are bigger shifts, bigger structural changes at work in the world today. And I feel like, you know, whether in Europe and Asia, we need to break our dependence on the United States, both emotionally and intellectually, as well as, you know, materially. Okay. 
thank Pankash for these illuminating words. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> ja, és el moment de, de tancar. Uh, Reagreir-vos tots la vostra presència, també els que esteu a l'altre cantó de les pantalles o de les càmeres, o d'on estigueu, a casa vostra. Gràcies, Joan, Carme i Agus, per les vostres preguntes. I, en fi, donem per tancat l'acte. Thank you very much, Pankaj. Moltes gràcies. Thank you.